the notion of, of, of organotypy, of actually using a buttress, a matrix, or a biomaterial, what do we have now? What do we have to do in the future? Because I think it's very rare that we'll be able to just get away with a lump of cells making something and hope that that's going to work. And so maybe if you could each say a couple of words about the interface with biomaterials. Um, so we've been using biomaterials for a long time now and obviously the material we've placed into the patients um, it's non-biodegradable so it's a permanent there were a number of reasons for that one was the regulatory issue um, it was simpler if you use um, biodegradable etc but I think one thing we've learned from these two patients is the delivery of those cells in a way in which they need to replace uh, a component or be functional as soon as they go in because they're very mature on that patch um, really does enable the possibility of delivering cells in the right form with the ability to function so I think the combination is going to become more and more apparent as more of these therapies come to uh, trial yeah, Rich? so for the heart I think uh, you would think that you'd need something like this because the heart has so much organization and structure. Um, but on the other hand, when heart cells divide, it looks like one cell sits here and the other sister cell goes way off to, uh, to another part of the heart. So uh, it's a pretty dynamic environment. And so I'm not sure if we'll need that. Uh, obviously, it's a place where we can couple things together with bioengineering, though, and make, make the transplant process better. Uh, what about conduction system? Um, well, reconstituting the conduction system is going to be hard. Most of the heart works together as a syncytium. So if you can get cells to form the right connections in the right period of time, then you actually probably don't need to worry about that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there are some matrices already available that they're using for uh, bridging defects in Achilles tears or rotator cuff tears. Um, they're non-cellular, but they, some of the studies have reported that cells integrate into the tissue. Um, but there still are some limitations with these types of approaches. Um, and the ACL is the best example. They'll, they'll either use a, an allograph or an autograph, uh, but usually someone who has an ACL tear is set up for osteoarthritis usually in the next 15 years. And this is thought to happen because you're not, the, the, the ability of the knee to function and stabilize the movement is not functioning how it used to be. So I think there definitely is a function for the matrix, but I think the cells, the combination of the two will, will probably make a more perfect tissue that's more similar to what In your case, development don't, created. You, don't you also need to deal with forces and stretch exactly and your cells don't always develop normally without that yeah no they definitely need it for proper maturation both developmentally and in you know adult patients that either have some sort of immobilization the tendon tissue will also degenerate so in some of the uh, sort of uh, was a physical therapy I think is a good example of this is some of the uh, things that patients have to do is either passive motion or active motion to kind of stimulate the cells and the tissue itself. So I think a combination, but also it, it begs an interesting biological question that could you pharmacologically figure out what that mechanical motion is doing and maybe find a chemical that simulates it. And sell it through marathon sports. Yeah. yeah. Right. That would go well, yeah. <laughs> David, what do you think? Anything? Well, right. So the, the blood tends to be a fairly autonomous system, except that um, there are cautionary tales about disordered activity of the stroma can lead to malignant outcomes. And the, the information provided by the stroma is also something that could be used to accelerate recovery and improve particular outcomes. So I think um, there are ways in which we can use it as a model to understand the signals needed that can be boosted pharmacologically, and also the ones to be cautious of because they might result in the dark side. But you're a, a niche guy, so yeah. I mean, can, can you imagine that actually you could do better? So maybe you don't have to deplete everybody's bone marrow first and you could put in a, a nouveau niche? Right, or, or that you, you know, there are multiple niches 
and they pair up with particular subsets of cells. So depending on what cell population you want to tweak in particular, uh -huh. you may be able to go out after its niche partner and drive it selectively. All right. Sorry. And Kevin, the brain. One of the most complicated, or you could argue the most complicated organ in our body, one that we still struggle to understand the structure and function of to this day. One reason that we initially focused on motor neuron disease is because it's a disease that affects one of the most evolutionarily conserved um, type of neurons in our bodies, one that we know a lot about the development of, and essentially one of the simplest circuits within our body. We know that many diseases where there's increased genetic traction, like psychiatric disease, likely specifically affect higher order brain structures that animals do not have and might um, result from specific circuit dysfunction that we can't model in organisms because it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, one of the most exciting breakthroughs in this area that you're alluding to um, from stem cell biology is the ability to take early cells produced from stem cells and allow them to self-organize in a type of human developmental process in the lab to make something that people have uh, termed human brain organoids. These structures, which can grow now um, in some people's labs for years at a time, take on astonishingly complex structures which resemble the early human brain. Right. And um, these promise the opportunity to potentially allow some of these circuits to develop on their own for study. We don't yet know to what extent having a genotype that will predispose to schizophrenia will cause the circuitry to be abnormal. Um, it's a very exciting area, it's a new area, it's one that raises many different types of ethical questions that haven't been encountered before, but it's quite exciting. Thanks. Any, would in the audience like to jump in? You know, we can, if, if you get a question from the audience, if you would repeat it also because it may be hard to hear, so. Yes, sure. Hi, David Gilmore from Life Capital. Professor Skadden, I, you mentioned that uh, establishing safety is uh, a great opening step in bringing some of these therapies to patients. Uh, it would seem to me, as a non-medical person, that the, there's a bit of a paradigm mismatch between the way we regulate uh, today and what regenerative medicine is all about. And we need some very, very different way of uh, trying to work with establishing uh, safety for these therapies. Is anybody working on this, and is there any hope? That's a great question. I think, actually, Pete, you've encountered all of the regulatory headaches of going through this. But I, I will say, uh, from my experience in the U.S., I found the FDA is, also, is feeling the need and uh, the interest in, in getting it right and interacting with academia to try to identify ways in which they can make this something that is a fairly rational process. It, it'll never be easy. But certainly, um, gauging risk with the in vitro systems that we have is so imperfect that they're, we're really, unfortunately, going to depend on the human experiment. Pete, do you want to say what you've gone through? Yeah, I'd say that um, actually in the UK it was very much a surprise to the regulator when we actually had our first meeting. They did not expect um, anyone with a cell therapy to be going to them in 2009. Um, so. I think what has majorly occurred following that, and definitely within the US, has been an education for the regulators themselves. So they have gone through a process of open meetings, open discussions, groups of scientists, to try and understand effectively what the FDA is majorly concerned about, which is safety. So they have educated themselves, I would say, very well now, they have already given clinical approval for a number of cell therapies as well. So they understand some of the limiting processes, some of the issues which they will need to track as well following the um, uh, approval of those trials. So I would say it's less of an issue in that they now understand that a cell is not a pharmaceutical um, and therefore needs to be considered in a very different way. Um, and they are prepared to open discussions very early with uh, businesses, academics, to uh, have a debate on whatever type of therapy that you're wishing to approach them to get approval. You know, it's interesting also how the FDA responds if you're a pharmaceutical company or you're a biotech company. 
If you're a pharmaceutical company, you tend to be held to the same standards, quality standards, as for drugs. They're actually more intrigued uh, by the uh, biotechnology companies. In my, this is uh, unsponsored, just, you know. I, I can't really defend that completely, but I can defend it pretty well. Uh, one, two, is I actually am a little bit sympathetic to them. I think there is as a lot of garbage out there now. I think there's many dangerous experiments, as Rich was alluding to, for example, in the heart field, where we've both been in a position of showing a lot of data are not reproducible. And I think there is that the, the fundamental scientists have sometimes jumped ahead, especially in the so-called mesenchymal stem cell field, my own personal bias, is that there's a lot of, uh, to be generous, borderline work. And so I think the FDA is in a genuinely uh, tricky position. The third thing is that what the FDA is best at regulating is what we call CMC, the quality control, and how are the cells, are the cells from uh, hospital A the same as hospital B, how identical are they, can you ship them, do they kept in the free, that kind of stuff they do very well. So if you can figure out that kind of, a, that kind of a, uh, 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 those elements of the safety, you're in pretty good shape. I'm personally more worried about the very fundamental work that goes into it because I'm afraid, I don't know how you guys feel about this, that if a lot of bad experiments go on, that they will close us down in the future. And I think it's, it's incumbent upon all, all of us to go in with a lot of fundamental work that strongly suggests that what we're saying is true. I don't know, is that an overstatement to you guys? No, I don't think so. In fact, I was just going to double underline that statement by saying that um, you know, as I was finishing graduate school and coming here to Harvard for the first time, it was really in the era where uh, early clinical missteps in gene therapy set that field back. And I think a lot of us who are now players in this regenerative medicine field are just deathly afraid um, that we'll, we'll make one of, those, one of those mistakes. And I think that, you know, the careful work of Pete and others is a good example of ratcheting up the biology and working in a an area like the eye where there are real ways to watch the cells and to monitor safety. And uh, I think many of us are afraid that missteps in that area will set this field back in the same way. I'm sure others have even more experience. In I would just add there will be mistakes. Um, and I think the issue clinically is how you're going to deal with those. So one of the major components with any regulatory approval is an expectation of something going wrong. And the issue is, if it does go wrong, what are you going to do? So, as, as Kevin says, for the eye, that's relatively easy. Um, you know, we use lasers in the eye. <laughs> so, you know, the bottom line is, anything goes awry, we just laser. Um, so, the worst thing would be removing the eye, obviously. But, again, it's a case of things will go wrong. I think where... Uh, Mark, you're coming from is, um, was that expected or not, given the preclinical information? And I think those packages do need to be strong. Don't get me wrong. They have to be very complete. But again, I think the FDA's major, I agree, is the ability to look at the manufacturing and the quality of that manufacturing. The FDA are excellent at that. Um, but again, their, their major concern, not necessarily, is efficacy. Okay, their, their major concern is safety. So how or in what way is your product safe? If it does go wrong, how or in what way are you going to ensure the safety of that individual? Um, the efficacy, you know, in the animal model, or in what, and recently uh, with discussions of the FDA, we, we're not using animal models, we're actually using IPS as the efficacy models now. Um, those uh, give some evidence as to why you should go to trial. But the major issue is always safety. Yeah, and I, the other thing to consider it, it, is how severe is the disease. If you have a desperate disease, even a rare disease, then I think you may have a very strong rationale to do the experiment. Uh, and that's where I think you have to be careful. But I have some skepticism about the athletes going and getting uh, joints injected. I don't know how you, Jenna, how you feel. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's 
an expert right now it's considered by the wider orthopedic community as an experimental therapy but part of the problem comes in because they don't manipulate the cells so they're taking bone marrow aspirates or aspirates from a stromal fraction from fat not manipulating it and then injecting it back in, into the patient and this doesn't actually require any oversight by the FDA so there are many clinics throughout the US and I've know of, I've seen advertisements for some in the Cayman Islands so you can vacation while they inject your knee with some sort of stem cell therapy but you yeah. don't know actually what you're getting yeah. and some cases you know there's situational or you know patients will testify that it, it makes things better but when you actually look at the studies they're not particularly well controlled um, there are some clinical trials ongoing but for the most part, there are risks associated with these procedures, such as ectopic bone, ectopic cartilage in a joint, which can actually cause even more damage or patients getting uh, even increased inflammation at the site. So I think, the again, the science behind it needs to be better Definitely fleshed yeah, out. Be yeah, stem cells on the beach. Doug, you had, a, and then. Well, I'm all for caution, but I wanted to ask a question in the other direction. And I'm thinking, um, I mean, an obvious uh, approach David touched on would be sickle cell. So how does one think about the regulatory environment where you're going to provide a new medicine, which is the cell, with a genetically modified one for sickle cell, which at least from a biological perspective seems like a really juicy target. Yeah. So, Well, there is, uh, and unfortunately because of the somewhat checkered history of gene therapy, there's actually a fairly rigorous and established paradigm for moving gene-modified cells forward. Clearly using the gene editing techniques are different, but no. sorry, the, the, the ability, the, the regulatory context for that, I think, is at this point pretty well defined. Vicki, I think you had So I, I'm also curious about the uh, practical aspect of, of broadening the testing of these new therapies where some of them, as Mark pointed out, are, are in conjunction with new biomaterials. Some of them require surgical manipulation to place and, and, and to monitor. So as you think about evaluating the therapy and doing the clinical study, you're vulnerable to the competencies, let's say the surgical competencies of the people in your study. You might be vulnerable to the, 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 physical, the, the physical therapy follow-up. So, so how much of a risk do we run and how do you think about mitigating that risk of making sure we see positive signal as opposed to losing it in the course of too heterogeneous implementation? Right? I mean, we lose signal by telling people, take these pills on the schedule, right? Um, so I just th there's a, th for the, some of some, not all, but for some of these therapies, you have a dependency on a, a high skill level for your co-testers. Maybe you want, you want to take that, please? Um, yes, without a doubt. Um, you know, if it's a surgical intervention, then clearly you do need to assess that as well. So through the regulatory path we went, we had to show um, that that surgery uh, was amenable. It was um, not going to create uh, uh, any significant problems. Um, in fact, the surgery we were trying to do with the patch, uh, we actually modeled it on a cataract surgery, which takes about 20 minutes. So the whole thing is delivered in um, a special injector. So we did go through a whole process again. And in fact, that injector is under a clinical trial as well. And um, so the patch, believe it or not, got clinical approval before the surgical tool. Um, so we went through a whole process on both of those. So you have to show objectively, you know, what, what is the criteria? How are you going to manage it? And even in terms of what is your comparator going to be against that surgical intervention? Yeah, the yeah, FDA will often, as we did when I was back at Nibra, uh, uh, therapy for hearing loss. And they were two sequential reviews. The first was for the surgery and the second was for the therapy. Yes. Uh, sure, let me give you one. Or oh, you got one there. Yeah. Hi. Um, so the science of regenerative medicine is doing phenomenally well, and in part thanks to all of you. But the business is doing terribly, right? And we are here at the business school. 
Um, the first two companies were the skin companies, Organogenesis and uh, Advanced Tissue Sciences. Between them, two companies have three bankruptcies. That's kind of remarkable, right? But two companies share three bankruptcies. That's not very good from the business point of view. Sorry? <laughs> not, not That's innovative, yeah. Yes, very innovative, right? Um, <laughs> really? the, uh, the second big one was Genzyme, born here, and their cell therapy business, which had um, Epicel, another skin therapy, and then uh, Carticel and Macy, both um, knee cartilage uh, replacements. The whole business was given away to Astro. I think we'll count that as a bankruptcy, okay? When you give away a business that you've invested probably $200 million in, it's not a good uh, solution for patients in the end. And the final one is Tengion, Tony Tala's groundbreaking technology for bladder recreation and surgery at Wake Forest. They raised $230 million and went bankrupt. So the first four are all strikeouts. I'm just curious what as the current generation, the next generation of leading scientists in the field, what lessons have you taken from these business failures? Because if the business fails, no patients get treated. It doesn't matter how good the science is. If the business fails, no patients get treated. And if we want to treat patients, we've got to make the business a success. So I'm just curious, what lessons have you guys all taken, you girls, guys and girls, I'm sorry, taken from these early failures on the business side to help ensure that patients do get treated from the, the terrific science you're all doing these days? It's a great question, and I think one that probably everyone would like a crack at. You want to just go down the line, Kevin? You want to start? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I can give you my answer in the context of um, trying to use these types of cells as new models for disease and drug discovery. And um, there we tried, in the context of Q-State, to take a crawl, walk, um, and then run sort of strategy. So we weren't really sure how ready the interface between new tools and electrophysiology from Adam's lab and the types of cells we were making in my lab would be for commercial use. So what we decided to do was to start a small company, um, really founded with only $100,000, and then go out and try to do small contract research with pharma companies to see if it might be to not take in a bunch of investment, um, to retain control of the platform so that we could really understand what it could and could not do, and then to grow it through those direct revenues. Once we had some sense of what it could do, we could go into a walk phase where we actually entered into agreements around drug discovery with pharma partners where everyone could benefit in that development, and then we hope the run looks like some of the things I was describing there now that we know what works and what doesn't work. And so, Maybe some of these first efforts kind of suffered from a little bit of over-exuberance and a lack of practical experience of what was really commercially possible at that time. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, in the blood we have the distinct advantage that we know it works. And so it's really a question of taking what is currently a niche therapy, a modest, underserved, uh, underutilized entity, and be, we think because it has been lacking in attention and directed innovation. It's been a, uh, an area that has been restricted to end-of-life care and try to move it forward by having very specific targeted ways in which we could advance portions of the process of transplant and that, and that way make a difference and capture essentially the, the thinking of providers by having a benefit that uh, affects one portion of the way they care for people, bring in other people then who are the uh, part of the care team and essentially broaden out the way in which people think about application of a technology that's previously been very restricted to a, a very distal end of the, the patient care experience. Yeah. And I, I would probably, for particularly the orthopedic field, you, I, the way I'm thinking about it and the approach I'm taking is probably similar to Kevin's in that you are not you're using the cells that you're making in a dish for drug screening strategies because if you're going to engineer a tissue for someone that's not necessarily a very cost effective way or a good business model at this current point in time in terms of how long it'll take to grow the tissue um, current currently there's no defined protocol to make tendons in a dish but if you were to grow the cartilage, it takes months, um, and it's not necessarily something you're going to make a huge amount of money. And if you have tons of patients coming in, it's going to take a lot of time. So I think a pharmacological approach and sign of a kind of a gradual approach at that, where you're testing in animal models, you can show efficacy along the way, and then that kind of will hopefully 
be a more uh, immediate sort of solvent business approach to the problem. So D David always pulls out this unfair advantage that his therapy actually works. <laughs> um, and for the heart field, the problem's been that a lot of the efforts have been based upon basic work that has primarily occurred in one lab or one lab and their friends. And it hasn't been that kind of advance that all of us say, hey, we try this and wow, that really does work. And, and, and we're all looking for that in the heart failure field. So again, it's clinical outcome, does it work? I mean, a good example in the eyes, there are two possible therapies for wet AMD. One was Macigen, one was Lucentis. Both actually stopped the bleeds, but only Lucentis improved vision and became a billion dollar market for Novartis. So um, its clinical outcome is going to be the first. The second is clinical ability to deliver that. So as you saw from my presentation, the ability to um, put that patch in the back of the eye is going to be a vitreal retinal surgeon. But we're doing it in a way which is going to be similar to cataracts, which means it'll only be a 45-minute um, outpatient procedure. So believe it or not, 70% of those patients who have that operation would have it awake. So, and then the third thing is, is reimbursement. Now in the UK, we've already had discussions with um, the various authorities which are now open to the possibilities that these types of therapies would be fast-tracked. So even by phase three, we, you could be reimbursed for the, for the um, therapeutic. And then finally, it was an issue which um, Mark brought up, which is there are 700,000 um, patients in the UK. There's about 400,000 in California which suffer from AMD. That's a lot of patches to produce. So again, we've taken an early punt, an early stage punt, to work with both a Japanese company and a German company to actually automate it. So they're already working on a machine that can produce, a single machine can produce something like 80,000 patches. And that machine could be based anywhere. So I think actually having all those on the go is important to make sure that it is a therapeutic that can be delivered and it's efficacious. I would argue very simply you invested in the wrong stuff. That if you really looked at the science, you, you know, not you, but the investors would have known it wasn't ready for prime time. And that's what I was, the point I was making before. Today it is. I believe very strongly that this will be, and has to be, the next wave of therapy, given the number of people who are aging. That the demand will be fantastic. But you have to go in to populations of patients where you can do a trial where you actually believe the fundamental science speaks to definitively to the therapy and it has to be believable and I personally think just as there was in the early days of genomics there was too much hype and uh, in the early days but today I would it be like not investing when the first monoclonals uh, we're having a problem. I think there are defined areas where we know the problems that were outlined very clearly, where we know the efficacy. Those areas, even if they're small and defined, especially if they're small and defined, those will be very powerful. And keep your, you know, timeline's going to be a decade. It's not going to be a tur turnaround of uh, uh, tomorrow. I mean, I think within five years you'll know about the eye. You may know about diabetes sooner. You certainly, we already have ways of expanding hematopoietic stem cells. CART therapy works for cancer very, very well. Uh, there are, so we know that there are therapy, cell therapies out there that work. So I, I would not be discouraged. I would say it's great that they failed in the past, but now's the time to get in, involved. Do we have a question? Yes. So failures are cost of goods and other things on the commercial side. We know there are things that work clinically. The challenge is how do we make them commercially uh, viable from a cost, from a distribution standpoint, and from other th some other things around um, making sure that everyone who delivers them has a high skill set. But we solved that when we did medical devices, right? There's a kit, and it goes, and people get trained. So on cost of goods, there's fully enclosed 
automated boxes now for GMP that presumably we can just drop every place we want to do things that are um, small scale. Uh, so we get the quality assurance, we get the cost down to something that's actually affordable so companies aren't going to go out of business. And then just talking about business model, which would be a really interesting case study for someone from the Harvard Business School to work on. Um, we know that companies, a lot of success is due to business model innovation, not technology innovation. So I think uh, this industry in particular is ripe for something, something around that. Um, so Barbara Nelson, Nelson Biomedical, thank you. Are there questions or comments? Yes. Yeah, my name's Peter Wirth. I was at Genzyme for a long time and uh, uh, was the outside general counsel for Biosurface Technology, which originated Epicel. I think it's a little premature to say that this is not working. Uh, I had lunch yesterday with the general counsel of Vericel, which is the company that picked up the two products. They're doing about 50 million in revenues. Uh, they're close to break even. Uh, they are in front of the FDA with a new version of uh, Cardicel called Macy, which is uh, supposed to um, improve the procedure. Uh, I think, you know, we've, we've learned a lot about these technologies, uh, but I think the reality is we're working in very complicated biological systems, and the, the, the efficacy or the impact that cells make on the body is pretty marginal, and we're putting them in, in situations where uh, there are fundamental biological processes that are not working very well. And so you get a, a modest effect from the cell trying to overcome a seriously broken biological process. And it's not a, it's not a big surprise that it's taken a long time. But I think it's a little premature to just say, you know, it isn't working, we ought to pass and move on. Well, yeah, I think it's, I would, stronger than that, I, it's working. And there, it's just working in uh, selected circumstances, and I'm extremely optimistic. Everyone's pointing at their watch and waving signs that, that we're done, but I just want to see if there's any more, one more question bef before, or any more before we stop. If not, I, I want to thank the panel. It was a great discussion. I appreciate it very much. <laughs>